it's uh, one o'clock on the dot here in South Africa. Uh, welcome to this beautiful um, Thursday, March the 25th. Um, my name is Rika Preiser and I'll be hosting this webinar. I'm based at the um, uh, Center for Complex Systems in Transition, which has just been <laughs> renamed recently a, a day ago to the Center for um, Sustainability Transitions. And we've had a stage a kind of update in our state of what kind of department or institute we are within the university, um, which will give us a little bit yeah, more autonomy to deliver courses, enroll PhD students and um, apply for funding in different ways. And we'll have one um, session, I'm sure we will actually launch the new name and status of the center. But um, as usual, the, the focus of the center is engaging with sustainability projects and, and sustainability challenges uh, with interlinked, you know, um, problems of energy, food, water, and governance within the Anthropocene, but also understanding how systemic, the, how the systemic nature of these interactions um, have to be sort of addressed through new methodologies, approaches, mindsets to um, understand the connections and the relations between all of these things in new ways and also what the social and political um, implications are for addressing problems in this way. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm seeing people will, are still sort of um, signing up and we've got someone already from Karlsruhe, Germany joining us. Tommy, uh, wonderful. Yep. Thank you so much for connecting with us and um, yeah, please, for all the participants, as you're joining, just write in the chat box where you're from and what is it that brings you to project management or to this meeting and uh, what what area of work or domain or work um, are you related to. It's my huge pleasure today to um, present or to introduce our guest speaker for our webinar, Professor Shankar Sankaran from the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. And um, uh, Shankar, thank you very much. It's already evening on your side and I hope you're high and dry. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I met Professor um, Sankaran a few years ago, 2018 um, in Corvallis in the USA at the International Society for System Sciences where I presented my work for the first time we, where he was appointed as the president for the following year, um, 2020 actually, to host the... Um, conference in South Africa and we've had many rich and interesting and wonderful exchanges to try and organize that until COVID struck um, but I'm so thankful for having met you Shankar and for the important work that you do in this field and the energy you bring to any meeting that um, that you attend. So just a short uh, introduction um, as you've also seen on our um, bio that we've put together for, um, for this meeting Professor Shank Sankaran has a deep uh, involvement um, in organizational project management uh, in various spaces. Um, currently he's at the School of the Built Environment at the University of Sydney. He's also the core researcher at the Center for the Informatics Research and Innovation at his university. And he teaches project leadership, organizational project management, systems thinking. Um, and he leads many um, in, you know, international journal uh, endeavors, uh, editorial boards. Um, he's worked all over the world. Uh, currently is the chair of the Global Accreditation Center of the Project Management Institute um, and committee member of College of Leadership and Management at Engineers Australia. Shankar, wonderful that you could be with us. Thank you for making time. Would you maybe just yeah, explain to us or share with us where you are at the moment. What is it in project management that you find interesting? And yeah, just just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, thank you, Rika. First of all, I'm I'm sorry that I missed an opportunity to be in Selenbosch. <laughs> we have been looking at Selenbosch uh, University. It's such a wonderful place. Unfortunately, we had to postpone that uh, conference, but I, I think someday we will have a conference in South Africa, I hope. <laughs> so my name is Shankar. Uh, I work at the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. I'm originally from India. I, I grew up in India as an engineer and I worked in projects as a control systems engineer. So I've always been working in system, but those are hard systems <laughs> which I worked with. And then I moved out of India. I worked in the Middle East. I worked in the, uh, Southeast Asia and Oceania. 
And about 20 years ago, I became an academic in an MBA program and then joined UTS in 2006. I've been here for about 15 years now. And I've been teaching in a Master of Project Management program, doing research in project management, and also uh, participating in systems uh, work. Because I also teach a course on system thinking to project managers, because project managers tend to break things down. And I often tell them, no, 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 that's not the only way. You have to stand back and look at things and look at the interrelationship. And uh, so I, I, I teach more soft system thinking these days rather than hard system thinking, because I moved over to the right side. <laughs> um, and I am also very much involved in the system society. I've been a member of that in 2006 or something. And, and just when I became the UTS and, and last year they elected me as president uh, and then I'm a past president now. Um, and I would like to talk about what I call organizational project management because projects are often used at technical things that you have some new initiative, you ask somebody to manage a project between a time and cost, but organizations also do projects to deliver their strategy. So the organizational project management is a way of looking at project management from the organizational side, not just at the project side. And how do you actually put all these things together so that your strategy is delivered? So before I, before I start, I'd like to um, introduce my colleagues, uh, Ralph Muller from the Norwegian Business School in Oslo, and Natalie Druin, who is an executive director of KEOPS, which is a mega projects research center and a professor in the uh, University of Quebec at Montreal. They both are not here, but they have sent me their slides with all their presentation. So you are going to hear them during this presentation. So I'm going to facilitate their presentation as well. Okay. But I thought uh, first, uh, I'll also talk. So Ralph Muller is from uh, Ralph, uh, Natalie and I have been working together on many projects, uh, including books since 2011, uh, when I first met uh, both of them in Umeå University where Ralph used to work. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to clarify some terms because uh, some of you may not be in project management. So we may talk a bit of jargon. So. This is a kind of a, a triangle of, of produced by the Project Management Institute. It says that any organization has a vision and mission. <laughs> it has a strategy and objectives. And to meet these strategies, they have operations like manufacturing, service, whatever it is. They also do projects, but organizations have limited resources. So they have to have a portfolio of initiatives, which they have to plan and manage. So we call that project portfolio management. And organizations have normal operations. They also have programs or project. I'll explain a little bit of a difference between programs and projects. And then organizations have resources with themselves or they borrow resources from outside. And so that's the triangle which explains the overall picture of organization project management. Great. I think that it's, it sounds like the holy grail that you have there, um, <laughs> um, Shankar, <Yeah. laughs> because this is the, the the project side of things that that everyone sort of you know tries to get their heads around. And I see that in our um, participants today, we have some of the leaders of very huge projects. And Kobi Molele, thank you for joining us. We have Martin Balwa. Okay. Um, yeah. They're also joining us, huge, doing huge projects within Africa in the development community and yeah. other people that I probably left out now. But I'm um, looking forward to your presentation, um, Applying Systems Thinking to Managing Projects, Shankar, and you've also shared with us in the flyer, yeah, the, the publications yeah. and the work you've done on that. So please, um, yeah, we're looking forward to your presentation. Would you like to share your screen so that it's um, show up um, in full screen? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, let me define, project is a temporary thing. It has a defined scope and resources and project management is application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques. So um, this, this is the way project managers learn how to manage projects, but there are also programs. When you have related projects and activities, they have to be coordinated. If you're building a hospital, for example, you have to build a building, you have to have the facilities, you have to do the clinician. So all the systems are different projects, but they all have a common goal. When they have a common goal and several projects are have to meet that goal, then we call them a program, right? 
Then we have portfolios. I explained that it's a collection of projects or programs or other works. They're all grouped together to deliver strategic objectives. That could be normal operations and projects. And the projects and portfolio and may not be related. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're independent because you may have several portfolios in your organization, some for new ventures, some for maintenance, some for operation. And project portfolio management is a kind of an integrated way of identifying what are the projects we have to do, how do you prioritize them, uh, optimize them, authorize them, managing the, manage them and program to meet strategic objectives. So that's portfolio management. Then what is governance? So the governance is a, is a set of relationship between the project management, its sponsor, the person who champions the project, its owner who is responsible for the results of the project and all the stakeholders. We will talk about structures and processes and they're also monitoring of performance. Right? But projects can be governed at project level, but you can also govern project at the organization level where you tie your, your governance with the corporate governance so that groups of projects and programs are all integrated together. So the governance plays a very important role. PMO, it's a project management office. It's a kind of a structure in organization which works across the operational organization. It uh, acts as a repository of policies, methods, standards. It also sometimes at a strategic level, it manages the reporting of projects to the top management. Then there are benefits. Projects are carried out to deliver benefits uh, that lead to strategic objectives. They can usually measure uh, measured uh, after the projects are, when the project is completed, it's handed over to operation, the operation run it, then only benefits can be realized. So often after a project is delivered, change management is required. And that's that. So project deliver outputs and change management and project deliver outcome. So we use that kind of language. And benefit management is how do you assess the organizational impact of a project or a program? So if you look at the governance levels in organization, there's the corporate governance, and that is managed by rules. Then there are board level governance of project. The board may have a governance role. Then there is a governance of project, which may be carried out at a higher level, and then the project goes. So there's a hierarchy of governance mechanisms. And project governance is applies to portfolios, programs, consists of, and links with the corporate governance framework, is basically value systems. What is what are the organization value? What are the responsibilities? What are the processes? And what are the policies? And also, how do you implement the project in the best interest of all the stakes? So this is a stakeholder view of um, project governance, which is what the OECD asks you to do. Because there is a shareholder view and the stakeholder view. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. So uh, we have been working uh, till 2011 to uh, write a few books. We, we started with uh, novel methods in uh, research. And sometime in 2017, we wrote a book called Organization Project Man. It was a collection of chapters by many scholars around the world. And we put together an edited book. And when this edited book was presented at the Academy of Management, we are asked by somebody to write a book. So we wrote a book in 2019 and 2019, this book was published. And then in 2020, I was asked to look after the management and organization section of the handbook of system sciences put together by the members of the system society. And uh, we wrote a chapter, which is called, um, how do you use a uh, viable systems model, which is Stafford Beer's work to projects because we wanted to link system thinking to projects. And sometimes in 2020, I also published a paper on how can you apply the viable governance model as we called it to UN sustainable development goal. That's the journey we have taken to reach here. Okay. Yeah. So this is a presentation by Rath Muller. So you will hear his voice. Okay. He's one of the creators of this, of this model. He does develop such a, such a model. Uh, the first reason was that there was a significant um, confusion about what goes in organizational project management. What is in there? Most of the definitions just focus on projects, programs, and portfolios. 
and leave very important things out like benefits realization management, like the strategy for the project-based part of the organization, et cetera. And therefore we, we were looking for the elements that make up a more complete picture of organizational project management. What are the different bits and pieces that must fit together for an organization to be good in executing in projects? And therefore we, uh, we did a large literature uh, review and we identified 22 different elements that need to be there for organizations to really practice and, and do organizational project management. That leads us to the definition of what is, what is OPM or organizational project management, but it's the integration of all project related activities in an organization no matter whether it's a hierarchy or a network. And the onion model lends itself very nicely to, uh, to this flexibility so that we can uh, use the content of, of the onion model easily for hier hierarchical models uh, of organization structure as well as for more network models. The, the, the nature of, of the firm that we are looking for or the, the capabilities of the firm that we are looking for are the adaptive capability. Yeah, can the company adapt to the uh, circumstances in the market and uh, keep up with the pace that, that the market prescribes? And the aim of, of the model is strengthening the efficiency and the effectiveness in, in, in project execution. Yeah, run the projects as quickly as possible through the organization to reap the benefits of them as quickly as, as possible. So altogether, it is a governance function. We yeah? are binding all these management functions of managing portfolios, managing projects, programs, managing the benefits realization, managing the paradigms for governing that, binding that all together is a governance function. So the OPM model is more or less the governance model. It really shows what function is in which place in an organization. Yeah, that gives a broader and more uh, faceted understanding of, of OPM. We also developed a method to understand companies, how they have implemented their OPM and assess them using uh, a self-assessment questionnaire and, and uh, the analysis that comes with it. So for practitioners, we developed a method to design or adjust OPM uh, implementations in the organization contingent on the organization's particular circumstances. And for academics, we developed a model of so far quite isolated elements of OPM. We brought them together and we also developed a theory how they communicate with each other, how they work together. And we will go through these things in, in the next few minutes. So let's start with, with the onion model as such. Yeah? And uh, we, we start in the center of the onion and uh, that that bears the question, what is at the center of organizational project management? What is at the heart of organizational project management? The answer is easy, it's project management. You have the transformation of opportunities into products or services. So a project is at, at the heart of, of the model, but the project is not alone. The project is closely governed by project governance. Yeah, so project governance it allows us to um, run projects in a consistent and predictable way so that we uh, hopefully aim the benefits that, uh, that we um, intended to have from that. So in, in this governance, project governance function, we have the roles in institutions like the PMOs, like the steering committees, steering groups, but we also have the policies for doing projects. We have the relations, which are the contracts. We have the project management methodology that all governs how project management is done. But what governs project governance? Yeah, that's, that's the organizational integration. Yeah. How is um, project work integrated in the company? Yeah, is it integrated as a form of programs with many projects for one goal? or is it individual projects or are we part of mega projects here? Yeah. With each of them, we have very different project governance execution. So this organization integration 
governs the way we do project governance, and the way we do project governance governs the way we do project management. But what governs organizational integration? Well, that's the business integration. Yeah, now we are entering into the, the, the business sphere of, of the company. Yeah, he, here we identify, prioritize, we authorize projects. And for that, we need to have a strategy. So what's the portfolio strategy of the company? Um, a strategy alone is not enough. We also need to have a process and we need to manage how the, the portfolio is actually done and executed. So we need portfolio management, uh, but we also need to optimize the portfolio. And um, we also need to look at do we really get the benefits that we wanted to have from those projects? So benefits realization is also part of this governing function called business integration, which governs the, the organizational integration, which then governs the, the inner layers. But what, what drives or what steers or what governs business integration? It is OPM governance. Yes, the means by which the totality of the projects are directed and controlled. Yeah, there's first of all the paradigm. What is it that we want to achieve with projects? Is it um, shareholder benefits or stakeholder benefits? Yeah, do we, uh, do, do we want to run our projects in, in a way that we aim for process compliance on, on the side of the project team and the project manager? Or do we give a, a lot of freedom to the project managers and we control them by the outcome of their projects? So what is the paradigm that drives the way we, we do projects in the organization? What model do we have here? Yeah, do we look at, at um, project management top down with a set of principles or bottom up with a set of rules? What is the governmentality? So how do we at the management levels interact with each other? And do we have a governance of project management, like a career path for project managers, a training program, a certification program, et cetera, et cetera. Now that then is, is governed by the top of the organization, yeah, where we have the OPM approach, the strategies for doing business by projects. Yeah. So we, they have the multi-project approach, which determines, do we take on any project that, that, that comes around or do we take on projects that make mainly use of our existing resources? Or do we take on projects that contribute to a higher goal, which cannot be reached with just one project? Yeah, so what, what is our strategy with the multi-project part of the organization? Then we need to decide whether we want to have an organization-wide PMO, project management office. And we need to, uh, to determine at the top of the organization the level of projectification, how much of our business is done in project and how, how, how much do people think in projects when they do their daily work. That leads us then to the last layer of the onion, which is the way the company represents itself in the market. Yeah. It can present itself as a, as a project-based organization, which does nothing but projects to satisfy their customers. It can present itself as a project-oriented organization, which looks at the outside to the market. It looks like they, they're doing all in projects, but internally they are very process-oriented and more like a manufacturing company. And the third option would be a process-oriented uh, company, which is uh, very much organized like a, a manufacturing organization with an optimized process for manufacturing and then developing a more or less standard product which is sold in the market. That's the entire model. And we're gonna look at some further facets of, of that in the, in the coming slides. The first one is uh, we, we developed an online questionnaire for uh, assessing organizations which gives us a, a dashboard of 19 different instruments to look at our organization, which we then can use to fine tune the implementation of, of organization project management in our particular company. If you are interested in doing a, a self-test, here's the web link. So um, you, you can uh, easily take this, this relatively short questionnaire, send me an email afterwards so that I can send you the, uh, the results of the analysis. 
Using this analysis, we looked at a, a large number of companies world, worldwide, and we found quite big differences in the implementation of organizational project management. Here, yeah, the process-oriented companies, they are yellow to red, so they, they are not so much interested in, in being very um, much concerned with the, uh, uh, the integration of, of OPM. But the project-oriented and the project-based organization, they put more focus on good project work and smooth running of projects through the organization. What we also see here on the left-hand side, we have all these, these elements and uh, on, on the horizontal axis, we, we have the, the different philosophies of organizations. What we also see here is that whenever there is a uh, a PMO, what we call an OPMO, an organization-wide PMO, when, when that is in place, the, 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 the rest of the implementation of organizational project management is, is more thorough, is more in, in line with project thinking. Yeah, so uh, no matter whether it's a hybrid, whether it's a process, project, uh, or, uh, oriented organization or project-based organization, an, an organization like PMO seems to have a big influence on the way we implement organizational project management. With that in mind, we can now look at the individual company. Yeah, and this dashboard that, that I, I talked about, you, you see here, yeah, we have the uh, we have the different layers for project management on the left-hand side, and then we move through the different layers that we saw in the onion model to the right hand side and then we have yeah our instruments to uh, to see the particular implementation of opm in, in a company and this is an example of a small consulting company if we analyze this now uh, then we see for example they are heavily dependent on project results yeah all the business is in projects and they aren't organization integration is projects only, they do nothing else. And um, they, their project results are, are not, not too bad. And they present themselves in the market also as, as a project-based company. Now let's look at how good they are with their projects. Yeah, We see in business integration, they have no portfolio management whatsoever. So in other words, they simply take on every project they can get. When we now look at how do they do their project management, we see they, they have no PMO, no project management office that steers the way we do project management in the company. They have no, no education, no training program for their no project managers. And they also have no project management methodology. So uh, there's a, a big gap between the, between the requirement on one hand to be very good in projects because it's the only thing they do and the reality of doing projects where there's no portfolio management, that means nobody decides on which projects to take on and which ones not. And the way they do project management in terms of building up a, a group of very experienced project managers who have a lot of tools and techniques and knowledge to run their job. So that, that, that's one way of applying that. What you might have asked yourself is, the 22 different elements in that, in, in that model, how does that work together? How can they work together and, and, and communicate with each other? And uh, for that, we, we used an existing uh, governance theory and extended that, which allows us then to, to identify how do these individual elements communicate with each other. So each element, in these uh, layers that we saw has uh, five dimensions, an identifier and, and then dimensions for visibility, epistemic, techno and precept. Yeah? So the, the actor is the identifier, is the person, the manager who, who does the work. Visibility is the, the tools and techniques and charts and tables they use. Episteme is the, the company's logic for decision-making, yeah, typically uh, influenced by the strategy. The techni are the, the means, the mechanisms, the procedures, the processes that are used, uh, for example, in portfolio management. Yeah. And the precept is the actual content, could be the project name or whatever it is that need to be passed on from one element to the next element. 
So in in, uh, in, in essence, the uh, the communication between the elements happens through the visibility, through the charts and, and tables, and the preset, which is the actual content that that need to be shifted from one element. And that uh, leads us to the end of the of, of the short introduction, what we saw um, was a model that integrates the OPM elements into one onion model. It is validated empirically and theoretically in, in, in many uh, different cases. Um, it provides an assessment tool for existing organizations to understand what they do, but also to fine tune their implementation of organization-wide project management. Yeah. And uh, of, of course, through that fine tuning, we also have an analysis report uh, if you um, take the, the questionnaire and that allows you to understand better what is done in your organization or in any organization. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you further interested in uh, organization project management, um, here are a, a few books that, that touch on the subject and also use our model for organization project management, for example, uh, in the handbook of system science for, as an explanation, how to run SDG projects and, and other large projects. Thank you. So that's a model, OPM model, which Ralph has described how we arrived at it, how it can be assessed and how you can get a feedback. We, we, we offer it free to organization because we feel that organization can benefit from this. So that's one of the things we do. Now we're going to talk about system thinking and OPM. Okay. So um, now we're, we're going to take you through why, why did we think about system thinking to apply to project governance? So that's our uh, idea now. So um, we talked about how we started with this organization project management, a book and then handbook and the UN system. So we started looking at what is a systems view of OPM. So we wanted to look at develop an architecture for OPM using Stafford Beer's viable systems model. And there's a group of people who have been doing work on viable systems in IT projects and they call it viable governance model. And the, uh, the systems engineers are also working. So this is the integration of the systems theory, a viable systems model and organization project management. So what is the viable systems model, which is uh, Stafford Beer used the brain and the heart to come out with a viable system model. So within an organization, there are operating units where job is getting done. And there is a meta system, which is looking at the planning and control at the strategic level. And the organization, as we all know, as a system, works within the environment. There is the immediate environment. So the operating units are often interacting with the immediate environment, whereas the meta system, the planning and the strategies are looking at the future environment. So the environment has two parts. One is the future environment and next is the immediate environment. So this viable system model has five elements, five levels. So it's called S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. So the current environment is S1, which is there are several operations going on. Two is the coordination function and the uncertain environment is three, four, and five and I explain all the levels to you. So S1 is the primary activities. This could be project, this could be manufacturing, this could be operations. Then at level two is the coordination of all these activities. If it's a big company, there are several operations going on. The coordination level is S2. In the case of project, there'll be several projects going on. There'll be a project coordinator or a project management office. S3 is optimization. It looks at the all the elements and how do you optimize all these operations. And S3 has an audit function, which actually audit function actually checks whether um, the operations are going well and informs the higher level management. S4 is the intelligence function. It's looking at the future and trying to figure out how can we, how can the organization adapt itself to the future. And at S5, which gets the intelligence from S4, makes policy making, it requires strategy. So the viable system model can be applied to organization. 
So we think that in, if you look at a normal project, the primary activity for S1 uh, project tasks, and S2, the coordination is the project management of projects. S3 is the governance of policies and project management office. In S5 is the steering committee or the policy level who steer the organization. So when we, when we map the organizational project management layers into the viable systems model, we thought these are the way. But when we looked at mega projects, because huge projects, infrastructure projects, mega projects may have several sub projects. So if you have a big transport organization, there'll be tunneling, there'll be um, rail lines, there'll be railway lines. So there'll be many sub projects, and there'll be a mega project manager looking after it. And uh, extra governance and the governance uh, will be governance at the higher level and the steering committee. But when we look at OPM, which the model that we just explained, project management, we think is that primary level. Organizational integration, which is one of the layers of the onion, is the coordination level. Integration, the initial level. OPM governance is at the intelligence level. And the philosophy or the highest level of organization is at this. So we can actually take the viable systems model and map it to a different type of project. So this is projects, mega projects, and organization project management. Now, uh, one of the one of the interesting things about mega projects is that mega projects often fail. <laughs> they take a long time. They exceed the cost. But however, they are always being built, more and more mega projects being. So Ben Fluber, who is the most famous mega project scholar in the world from Oxford, he says that why are mega projects built? So he says that they, they, they are built in spite of all their failures and issues is because there are some sublimes. Okay? So sublime is technological sublime. Engineers and technologies get very interested they want to build the longest uh, bridge, the tallest building, the fastest train, and they push to get mega projects uh, organized, uh, approved. Then there are politicians. The politicians want to build monuments to themselves for their community generates. So they build big things, politicians, uh, government time, this particular thing was built. And, and that is why some of the mega projects economic, the business people and the trade unions want to make a lot of money. So they push for mega projects. Money can be made for the contractors, workers, construction and transportation consultants, bankers, inventors, everybody gets money. And there are artists, Frank Gehry or somebody like that, who builds a beautiful building, the Guggenheim Museum. They get pleasure in designing something very exotic and they build a mega project. So like the San Francisco Golden Great Bridge. So a mega project paradox is because even though the mega project costs a lot of money, create a lot of environmental damage, they, they, the people still build a lot of mega projects. So our idea was, can we use this uh, idea to push for mega projects that would actually sub <laughs> commit goals? So we said, can we excite engineers and technology to engage in projects that actually contribute to sustainable legacy that reflects on their union, that is money to be made and jobs to be created in products and services. And we attract this to think elegant solution that can help beautify the world, moving it away from degradation. How can we do this as a society? So one of the things we asked was the UN Sustainable Development Goals are progressing very slowly because the number the, the number that are being done are very small. But if somehow we can attract, uh, create a sustainability sublime, and then if that sustainability sublime takes off, like for example, now Jeffers is donating a lot of money to uh, for sustainability, then we can persuade them to use mega projects but we can, but how do we govern them? So this is, so Malcolm Bapan, he's the uh, uh, United Nations, and he says that there can be applied to uh, sustainable projects. It's the governance model from transition management because you can take a long-term iterative structural change, <clears throat> 
So this is um, this is inter. So <clears throat> if you look at action management, things have coordination of markets, hierarchies, and network. That is, you have systemic interdependent complexity. It's innovative, legitimate, and gaps lack policy dimension. Then you can have experimental governance, which is bottom up, not top down, iterative. It's complex, diffuse, diverse, but lacks context. But you can also have network governance, which is distributed, diverse, requires coherence and oversight, process management. So he, he met a, a Mokalban's work shows there are different forms of governance, which can be used to develop sustainable projects. So if you if you do use that uh, idea, uh, okay. So then we thought, how how do we govern use these governance mechanisms for UN Sustainable Development Goals? We can apply the viable system governance model. So we can have primary activities, secondary activities, uh, organization, intelligence, and policy. So the, the, at the S1 level, these could be the mega ST, uh, sustainable development project, which can be developed through, because of we have created a sustainability sublime, motivating people to run projects to uh, develop, uh, contribute to sustainability. Then at the UN itself, there are UN style SDG hubs, and we can use that existing structure to develop the coordination level. And we can ask them to think about the various governance structures that Monkul Ban has uh, suggested and adopt a particular governance model that will help a particular mega project. Then at the UN, which is the optimization, the UN has a regular reporting mechanism. So we can use that reporting mechanism to understand how these projects are working together. And at the intelligence level, the UN has also has can create a strategy hub and this exists in the UN. We can create that strategy hub to think about the intelligence. And at the policy level, which is the UN uh, strategy governance level, that's the secretary general's level, which monitors. So we thought that we can uh, help, the, help with the attainment of sustainable development goals by promoting a sustainability sublime so that mega projects can be um, commissioned, but they have to be governed. To govern them, we, we think of adopting a kind of a uh, viable governance model. So this is basically our idea. So what we, we, have, we have shown you is uh, system thinking can be applied to normal project, mega project, but we can also be applied to uh, systems uh, uh, develop the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Okay. So I'm going to stop this slides and then um, there's one more I had to show you. <laughs> now this is uh, as a presentation by Natalie Drouin. Hello, my, my... my name is Natalie Drouin. I'm the Executive Director at Chaos and Professor in Project Management at UCAM and Adjunct Professor at UTS in Australia. I am glad to present a practical illustration of the viable mega project governance system, the CDPQ Infra case. The Caisse de dépôt et de placement du Québec, the Caisse, is a leading global investor located in Quebec, Canada. Over the past 15 years, the Caisse has invested in key sectors and infrastructure. These investments have allowed the CAS to acquire experience and knowledge from global experiences to carry out projects. For example, the CAS has invested in the Canada Line, which is the uh, light rail transit connecting Vancouver Airport to downtown. The CAS has been a shareholder in the Heathrow Express, the fastest train between Heathrow Airport and central London. In January 2015, the government of Quebec and the CAES signed an agreement that lays down the general framework and principles that govern the business model between the government and the CAES for implementing, managing, and financing major public infrastructure projects. The purpose of the agreement is to determine the main roles and responsibilities of the government and the CAES the governance structure, the process for completing the various steps, as well as the financing methods. With this agreement and Bill 38, 
The case has moved a step forward in putting in place a wholly owned subsidiary called CDPQ Infra. Thus, the planning, financing, execution, and operation stage are managed in an integrated manner by CDPQ Infra, which acts as the owner operator of selected infrastructure projects of the case. This figure shows the governance framework of CDPQ Infra and its five main VSM components. The governance committee is active during the planning and construction phase of projects. With representatives from Quebec ministries, its mandate is to interface with the executive committee, coordinate the activities within the government, ensure the consistency of the accepted solutions based on the major orientations and receive progress reports from the executive committee. The executive committee acts as an interface during the implementation phase between the case program directorate and the governance committee. It approves all rules of governance, orientations, objectives, work programs, budgets, strategies, studies, and reports. It also acts as an interface for the assessment of projects. During the construction phase, the CDPQ Program Directorate prepares all the deliverables with the support of operational subcommittees. It follows the state of progress of the work of the operational committees, ensures the consistency of the chosen solutions, and approves the main deliverables. Finally, an operational committee is established for each project and is discontinued at the solutions proposal phase of the project. Its main roles are to develop solutions which maximize the technical and economic aspects, develop recommendations to the case program directorate, and monitor the consultations. If we deepen in the roles and responsibilities between the government and the case, what I can say is as follows. Prior to the project, the governance committee identifies the infrastructure projects which the government intends to implement. Upon confirmation of interest by the government, the next step is to hand over responsibility to the case. The case keeps the executive committee informed of the progress on the definition of the project and the recommendations. Then, the case through CDPQ Infra is responsible for consulting with stakeholders to validate expectations and keep the executive committee informed of the progress. Based on the final specifications of the project, CDPQ Infra completes the studies, defines operational costs, prepares the completion schedule, validates the completion methods and the, plan, uh, the preliminary financing costs, and determines the economic model. However, we can note that there is no specific process for the assessment of non-financial benefits of the projects for the communities. Solutions are then proposed to the government. The governance committee receives the solutions proposed by the case program directorate through the executive committee. The final option is chosen by cabinet. After project approval, a definitive project agreement between the government and CDPQ Infra is signed and project implement implementation can start. CDPQ Infra assumes all construction risk, choice of suppliers, design risk, technological choices, construction cost, commissioning, operational risk, and so on. CDPQ Infra selects contractors based on the tendering process according to the parameters outlined in the legal agreement between the government and the case, with a view to ensure efficiency, transparency, and sound competition. If we look now at the different systems, let's start with system five. 
The policy-making institution is the government of Quebec. By law, the case is responsible for delivering mega infrastructure projects. The case favors the model of putting in place a separate entity, CDPQ Infra, to deliver projects such as the Réseau Express Metropolitain, we, we call it the RAM here in uh, Quebec, uh, Canada, which is basically the largest automated transportation system for the metropolitan area in Montreal. The entity has a well-defined governance structure that identifies the interface and relationships between the government representatives, the case's business interests, and the operational delivery of the major projects. In terms of organizational philosophy, CDPQ Infra is a project-based organization. Major projects are the unit of production, innovation, and competition. The case's management made the strategic decision to run this subsidiary by projects to generate returns and benefits for Quebecers. Projects are therefore seen as the normal way of doing business within CDPQ Infra. For system four, the case adjusts to the current environment and towards future environments through a corporate governance approach that, that is shareholder oriented. The project managers are controlled by achievement of project results, but they also need to follow the process defined in legal agreements with the government. The governance model within CDPQ Infra is a top-down, principles-based approach. And governmentality is a mixture of authoritative go governmentality, which emphasizes process compliance and rigid control structures, and liberal govern governmentality, which uses economic means to steer the decision-making of the case. For system three and three plus, the steering and control of the operative system at the case is done by CDPQ Infra, which basically selects contractors according to the tendering process. Periodic status, reports, review meetings, and other means of monitoring are clearly addressed through roles and responsibilities specified in the legal agreement and its governance framework. Although some reporting processes and guidance are provided in the legal agreement and its governance framework, the government does not exercise control over the assets of the project and does not automatically become the owner of the project. The CAS and CDPQ Infra undertake to respect the process defined in the legal agreement but they act as the project owner and project manager for the implementation phase of the projects. The asset and structures constructed or operated remain the property of the case. For the coordination of the sub projects, the case put in place a special proposed entity that I, I mentioned earlier, that took the form of CDPQ Infra, a wholly owned subsidiary to finance, plan, and deliver its mega projects. The mega projects under the responsibilities of CDPQ Infra are complex temporary organizations to deliver clear outcomes for the case and meet the government's needs. The governance framework sets the limitations within which CDPQ Infra and its project management team execute their tasks and are held accountable for them. It includes steering committees, controlling processes, a process timetable, and a tendering process. Thus, organizational integration through the SPE is the zone or the system where project managers interact to deliver their projects. Finally, system one, the activities of the project manager of the mega project at CDPQ Infra are framed by the governance layer. 
Within this framework established by a legal agreement, the CAS and CDPQ Infra assume responsibility for the project implementation and of its operational risk. In conclusion, the government, the CAS and CDPQ Infra are two viable systems that fulfill requirements of policy, intelligence, control, audit, coordination, and operations. The two viable systems are open governance and mega project governance. We say open governance because CDPQ Infra comprises the governance of the sum of all projects and their supportive activities and builds on projects at, um, as its business model and organizational philosophy, as well as a sensitivity to respond to market opportunities. We also say mega project governance because CDPQ Infra is also responsible for delivering major projects characterized by the complexity of the uniqueness, scope, and the management of a large number of stakeholders that requests to capture and process different information as per stakeholder needs and demands. It also needs to choose and coordinate many suppliers following a rigid tendering process. And finally, mega project governance could, could benefit from less symbolisms, which is S5, and more realistic planning, S1, while shifting the focus from strict process compliance, which is the S3+, to accountability for project success, which is the system four. So thank you very much for your time and for listening to this presentation. Okay, uh, we finish now. Sorry, it took a bit longer than I thought. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, Shankar. I think the last sentence also that Nathalie mentioned there, um, understanding the shift from compliance to accountability is probably one of the most <laughs> difficult things to do and to actually um, work out in, uh, in reality. So, um, and it's given us, you know, just maybe a different language also to, to, to take apart something that is often seems very, um, yeah, yeah, I would say layered in a way so that we could actually, in a sense, uh, get a better understanding of how things can be approached differently from, a, from various layers um, so that we can look at our projects and um, those kinds of implementation um, challenges anew. We've got one um, question in the chat box, um, Shankar, which I'd like to ask you before we close formally, and I'd also like to invite anyone who'd like to stay on and engage with Shankar personally to, um, to do so. Um, he had offered that to me in the chat box. <laughs> so um, we, we'll formally close after this one question and then um, ask those who have more time wanted to engage to maybe stay on if they want to. But there's a question, question from Rob, Roger asking what provision is there when it's uh, discovered during the implementation that the chosen solution needs to change? How do you, how has that been worked into the, not to the systems model? Well, the, the main, main, main reason, one of the reasons why that happens is because the audit systems are not very good. So often mega projects have gateways where you have to have audits at a particular time. And at that time, they have to make a decision that this solution is not working. Then they have to go back to the drawing board and change the solution. So this is often difficult for project managers because project managers don't want to change their things. And that is where the portfolio level decisions have to be made. So that is why the layered royal at the portfolio level, you can say this project is not working. I can stop this one. I can start something else. So the portfolio level decision has to be made at that time. And often projects are not terminated, which is a problem because when the project is not going wrong, people still want to hold on to it because project managers, project team members think they lose their job. So I think uh, this, is, this is a hard, difficult decision to make. But one of the things we found was that if you have a stakeholder orientation in governance and outcome control rather than shareholder orientation and behavior control, because you can 
put a lot of rules and processes. Actually, the results are better if you have stakeholder orientation and outcome based. So you provide boundaries within which people can operate. The other thing that is happening is the governmentality is becoming very important because you build the governance to within the people that they have to govern themselves when they do the projects, not that governance comes from somewhere up there and operates on the project. So this, these are some of the things that are developing in project management at the moment. Great, and that is speaking back to the kind of traditional approaches or traditional theories yeah. um, and implementation strategies. Great, thank you so much. Um, Shankar, I'm always uh, aware that people's time, we at this, we usually, this is a lunch hour meeting and people then um, have meetings to start at, again at two o'clock. Okay, um, right. <laughs> there's one more question uh, that I'll ask, answer from Michael. So if, if anyone else would like to leave, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, but maybe Shank you know, Shankar um, has indicated that he could stay on a bit longer um, and answer Michael as a question, how does, Digital, digi, digitization, or maybe digitization and information right. flows fit into the model? Have you done a data centric view? Uh, not really, because we this is a model which is a general model, it's not specific to certain applications. Uh, one thing that is probably missing in the model there are two things in the model which we have, which we think have to be taken care of. One is leadership. Where does leadership sit in, in the model? Mm -hmm. and the other is the information system and data. Uh, there is um, data management frameworks and data um, uh, governance frameworks, which are used in, 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 there are standards for data governance. Those need to be applied. Then you can actually use the viable system model and change the governance model to a data governance model. That's what I can say at this moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But data is important to a project, yeah. Yeah, and how that, that gets sort of in, mixed into all of those. Um, Shankar, um, thank you so much. I realize you have um, done a great honor to your co-authors by inviting them and for giving them time and space to also share their views, although they couldn't make it here today. And thank you for, yeah, for the allegiance that you've shown also this collaboration and the work you've been doing together. Um, I can just point to the papers that we've listed in the invitation of the flyer. Those are really groundbreaking um, papers. And if any of you wanted to connect with Shankar, who's I think extremely experienced in understanding these different um, viable systems models work um, and project management, uh, feel free to contact me and I can connect you with Shankar or maybe just Google him, his profile is there. Um, and he's always in, enthusiastic to engage. Um, yeah. So I think, especially in our field, as one of our attendants, Rob Young just mentioned, project management is absolutely crucial and overlapping with systems thinking approaches, a copy of the slides and notification of the recording would be great. So um, Shankar. Yeah, I think from an organizational theory perspective, project management is a dynamic capability of an organization which can sense and uh, use the sensing to develop projects. So project management, if your organization has good project management capability, it can succeed better. That is true. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I like the way that you say it's a sensing capability yeah. um, and it's not <laughs> rigid and stale, but uh, it should be alive and enforcing and adapting and transforming to a sense. Yeah. Thank I would like to thank everybody for staying on. I wish I had spent left more time, but the managing of the slides took some time so but I, I i hope you appreciate the work that has been done and it is that this is more like an overall concept it's a holistic view of projects rather than a te technical view of projects yeah totally no it seemed uh, and you've done great uh, to to incorporate the your, your author's voices in here and thank you for that um and also for the yeah for the technical abilities you brought to this, we'll have a recording of this, and it will be a little bit edited. So um, um, we'll post the recording of this um, session. We'll also post on the CST website. There's a little tab for videos, and if you scroll down to the um, lockdown webinar series, we'll we'll post this there and we'll make it available. So thank you very much, and people yeah, there's already great feedback in the chat box, um, Shankar. So thank okay. you so much thank for you. your Great time job. and um, uh, looking forward to the, yeah, the great work that you're doing in this, in this space.
Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs>